Good evening. Let's stand together. Page 396 in your hymn book. Page 396. The words will be on the screen. Let's sing it together tonight when the roll is called up yonder. Page 396. pages over 390 love lifted me Love lifted me when nothing 
right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you uh, for bringing us back another time together. Lord, I pray that you'd help us in the service tonight. Would you be pleased by all that takes place? Father, I pray that you'd be with the classes being taught downstairs tonight. Have your will and your way there. And then, Lord, we'll uh, thank you for all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated as the choir sings.
Let's all stand. We'll sing page number 169. On the second verse, turn around and greet someone. The teenagers are going to go down tonight, but they're going to go down after the offertory. So don't leave till after the offertory. Page 169, Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you war evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Try and read some of this. course again, but we're going to add an extra power in there. Power, 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 power. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. I don't think anybody was listening. We're going to do it one more time. Putting four powers in there, all right? Instead of just two, we're going to double put four in there. As you make your way back to your seat, let's sing that chorus together. There's power, 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 all right? All together on the chorus. Actually, we're going to do it with eight powers this time. Ready? And there is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious. All right, you can be seated. Brother, brother uh, Dick Bunny used to, after we did that, he'd add eight powers in there, and he'd always, as soon as we're done singing, he'd say, because there's a lot of power in the blood. And he was right, but after adding that many powers in there, there's a lot of spit flying through the auditorium is what there's a lot of. Come on, men. We'll get our offering this evening, and we'll have a special during the offering. Brother Dowdy, if you can get ready for that. Um, no, no new announcements other than what I made this morning. I would ask you to pray uh, for... Uh, Sarah Ashby's twins, they are both doing better now. Continue to pray for them. There was one having some breathing issues for a little while. I think that it's uh, getting a little bit better. So you need to pray for those little ones. And then uh, Miss Teresa's daughter, Tiffany, uh, her baby is still in the hospital in Jackson. Uh, I'm sorry. 
came home a good deal. Came home today, then keep praying for him as well. And then while uh, we had we had just left from Manu and Manai, and um, Mother Manu texted me. I, th- I think it was the, the next day. I can't remember. Uh, the days are all run together right now. He, but he texted me and said that Manai had gone into labor. And um, they, uh, there's some, some complications there as well. But she had uh, had a little baby boy, and uh, there are some problems there, some breathing issues. I don't know all of the details, um, but you need to pray for that little one as well. I don't know the name. Uh, I understand they don't pick names very quickly uh, for new ones, for new babies in, in India. But uh, you pray for Brother Manu and Miss Manai and that little one as well. All right, there's other prayer requests we went over in prayer meeting. I trust, ladies, that you were in prayer meeting as well, and you went over your prayer list. Just remember those, pray about them this week, if you would, please. All right, well, let's ask the blessing on the offering, and then we'll hear from the ministry over during the offering. Lord, thank you for another chance to give back to you. Lord, thank you for what you've done through this little church. Lord, I pray that you find us faithful in our commitments to you. <clears throat> Lord, would you continue to use us to, to reach around the world with your word? God bless the offering tonight, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Many times I have wondered about the sights of that city and all that my eyes shall behold. I will see all the wonders when I enter that city There forever to be safe in his fold Some morning you'll find me touring that city Where the Son of God is the light You'll find me there on the streets so pretty Made of gold so pure and so bright with Jesus, the one who gave me the victory and led me across the divide. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where with him I'll ever abide. Here on earth we have troubles that to us seem so heavy, but in heaven no one will be sad. Mom and Dad will be singing, Heaven's praise will be ringing For the dearest friend I ever had Some morning you'll find me touring that city Where the Son of God is the light You'll find me there on the street so pretty Made of gold so pure and so bright With Jesus the one who gave me the victory Who led me across the divide Some morning you'll find me touring that city Where with him I'll ever abide Some morning you'll find me touring that city Where the Son of God is the light You'll find me there on the street so pretty Made of gold so pure and so bright With Jesus the one who gave me the victory Who led me across the divide Some morning you'll find me touring that city Where with him I'll ever abide Where with him I'll ever abide Thank you. Let's take our Bibles this evening, please. Uh, youth group, you are dismissed to go right downstairs. And the Brother Dowdy's heading down there as well. Look at that good number of teenagers on a Sunday night. Amen. So good to see that in a church. Those kids could be anywhere tonight. They're not at church because they're bored and can't think of anything else to do. They're at church because they want to be here. Now let's stand together. Stand together. Find the book of First, uh, First Corinthians chapter 2. We'll finish some thoughts we started this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. I'd like to just point out, I didn't say much about it this morning, but we make a big deal about the capital S with the word spirit. Um, but if you'll notice in this place in Scripture, it's a lowercase s, and I think sometimes it's just as important. It's just as important to make out a big deal about it being a lowercase s. 
We're not talking about the indwelling Holy Spirit here. We're talking about the spirit, the, uh, the, the um, attitude or the air, I guess, that is of God. And it's very important that we understand this. There's a, uh, I shouldn't have even mentioned it because I don't have time to get into the whole study, but there's a, a mention of the old, in the Old Testament of Jesus Christ it says that God is going to place his spirit upon him. And it's a lowercase s. It's simply saying that the attitude, the outlook, that air uh, is, uh, of God would be upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And here we find that it's also with us. It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world. It's a very negative and a very fearful spirit. We've not received that spirit, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Father, thank you for another chance to open your word to this place. Lord, help us this evening and show us something real and new from your word. God, encourage our hearts. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I think I'd like to just give space for a few testimonies this evening before we get into the message. We're not going to give out the microphones, and and so I don't want you to think we're taking the whole service for this, but if if the Lord has just given you something special to be thankful for, and uh, sometimes my heart just gets full, and uh, I just feel like it's going to burst with gratitude, and um, I feel like that right now just because of how productive the trip was from India and and all of that, and uh, I'd like to be able to thank the Lord publicly for those things. I assume that you do too. Uh, so if there's maybe a three or four testimonies very quickly this evening that you'd like to just thank the Lord for something he's done in your life and you'd like to share that, I'd love to hear from you this evening. Raise your hand and I'll call on you. Anybody at all? Yes, ma'am, Miss Prater. Amen. Amen. Sure. That's a blessing. Amen. Good Christian counsel and guidance is something to be thankful for. Yes, ma'am. All right. Somebody else just want to thank the Lord for something this evening? Miss Molly. Amen. Yeah. I would have completely agreed with you before this trip. I just took with Miss Hannah and her sweet attitude. <laughs> it was a fun trip. It was a fun trip. We'll probably never be welcome back in India again, but it was a fun trip. Uh, Christina, what are you thankful for? Amen. Amen. All right. I don't know. Brother Henniger. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's exciting. I went back and looked at my notes. I, I, I journal quite a bit, not as much as I'd like to, not as much as I used to. Um, but I was looking at some of my notes from five years ago when I started praying about people groups and those kinds of things. And uh, just trying to come up with a rough draft. I didn't realize at the time how rough it really was. Uh, it was a rough draft of what it would look like. And, and I was looking at my notes, and, and I wrote down that... Um, I can't see how this could, could take any less than 10 years uh, just to get started. And uh, I wrote about how daunting that seemed to me. And to look back over the last five years, it's been almost six years since I wrote that, uh, but what the Lord has done in those six years, just amazing things. Just to, hey, did, you know, we're reading our Bible uh, about God using pagan kings to accomplish his will and to bring things about and... Uh, started praying all those years ago, and I believe that God was moving and, and orchestrating and working in people's lives. Uh, the people we, we didn't even know then, some of them I'm sure we don't even know now, 
But God's been working behind the scenes. Just amazing stuff to be able to be involved in that Zonka project. Uh, two people asked me if we could play the video again tonight because they weren't able to be here this morning and hear it. And we're not going to do that. If you weren't here, you missed out on it. It was a, uh, we'll, we'll maybe do it again on Zonka Sunday or something. But um, um, just encouraging to hear those first few, few verses uh, translated into that language and, and to be able to hear it read from a, a native speak, speaker. It does something for me. Uh, it does something for me. And very encouraging. I was telling the men in prayer room, I was telling the men in prayer room that um, God uses some most unlikely people. Uh, one of the young men that was helping us with the translation, and if God is, if it be the will of God, I believe that it's going to, he'll be one of the, the permanent workers on this translation. Um, he was saved as a, as a teenager in a monastery in Bhutan. He was in training to be a monk. His father was a monk. And I want you to listen to how he got saved. He got saved because the monastery hired a cook who happened to be a Christian. <laughs> he said the cook would sing songs, and him and a few of the other young monks would, would ask questions about the songs, and that cook would just share the gospel with them. And he ended up, him and a couple other got saved right, right out of the monastery. It was pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. Uh, Anyway, lots of lots of stuff. I'm just saying God's working. God's working in ways we don't even see, we don't even understand. We just gotta follow by faith. Steve, you had your hand up. Amen. Thank you, Steve. For the Piper, you'll be the last one. Oh, well, I have one more. Not everybody has heard the testimony of how God is working in your heart, how you met some Zonka people, I believe it was in Lansing, and how that all, God has worked that around us. I know there's a lot of new people here that haven't heard that testimony here, but maybe sometime you can take some few minutes sure. to how God miraculously brought all that to us. Sure. I'd, I'd be happy to, can't this evening, but it's a it's one of those stories. Everyone thinks their testimony is the most amazing testimony in the world, and, and I don't want to bore people with it, but God used several things like that uh, to confirm some things in my life. Melody, you'll be the last one this evening. We are blessed, aren't we, folks? We are I was teaching uh, the Bible college students there, and I, I don't fully understand it myself, and so I, I don't, I'm not even going to try to explain it to you, but India is more tribal in nature than anything I have ever seen anyplace else. These, there's hundreds of tribes, and th they, they hold to their tribal identity, and most of these tribes have their own language. And at one point, I was teaching about the importance of um, giving the sense of Scripture. This is a passage from Nehemiah 8. It talks about effective Bible preaching. It says they read the Scriptures, and they uh, gave the sense of the Scriptures, and they caused the people to understand the Scriptures. And I was talking a little bit about giving the sense and the understanding. And um, I'm speaking in English to these Bible college students who all have an English Bible in their lap. None of them speak English as their mother tongue, their first language. None of them do. They are, they've all, they're struggling to learn English because that is the only language that is common there at the Bible college. And I, I stopped, and to prove a point, I don't remember what the exact point was, but I went around the room, and I had each, each student tell me the name of their tribe and their mother tongue. And in that room, including English that I was speaking, there were 12, 12 languages in that room, 12. 
absolutely incredible. And here's the part that just cut me to the heart. Of those 12 languages, I th- after talking to Brother Manu later, I think only three of them have a Bible in that mother tongue. The rest of them are having to read from a and And for those who say, well, just teach them English, well, let them use English, it is not what people think that English is the most common spoken language in the world. Go to India with me one time, and you speak English to these people, and let me know how that goes for you. Um, I literally, to try to teach them, I write out one sentence at a time and have to explain every, every word. Um, it, we're just blessed, is all I'm trying to say. To sit here, we don't think about how blessed we are to have a Bible in our language. Uh, it's, it is just, it, it, it's amazing to me. It's such a blessing to have it. Such a blessing. And uh, so many of you have labored with us in prayer and in giving and making it possible for people to go and uh, make this translation, and uh, thank you for your faithfulness. It's dear to your heart, and I hope this morning was an encouragement to you as you got to hear uh, the uh, Zonka-speaking man read those verses for the first time in those language. I, I didn't fully understand it. I didn't understand the, the importance of it until we started going through it. We had a copy of the English New T- or the, the Zonka New Testament that was translated from the Good News for Modern Man uh, equivalent, and um, they hired to, to make that translation were monks. Practicing monks were part of the translation crew to make that translation. The opening verse in John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As we began to go through there, we didn't make it even through the, the first three or four words before there was a real problem because of the word the. In the beginning, um, they, there was some discussion between uh, the two translators and, and Miss Hannah. Miss, Miss Hannah was looking at, uh, at the Greek and making sure that every word was represented and expressed in the new translation. And the phrase, the beginning, was not there in the Zonka translation that is bad. And the, the, the boys doing the translating were having a hard time, time figuring out why it was so important. Well, if you believe in reincarnation, then something being in a beginning is not a big deal. But Jesus existing in the beginning, the beginning, before everything was, it was him. It's quite a big deal. It's quite a big deal. Every word matters. And I'm so thankful for the, uh, for the, the ability God has given Ms. Kratzer. And um, just uh, not, it just sounds weird for me to say it this way, Hannah, but I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the way things went there in that room. And... Um, I think the Lord was pleased, and that's what matters the most. Amen? Amen. All right. I told you this morning I wasn't going to spend much time talking about it, and I just spent 10 minutes talking about it. All right. Let's get back into our Bible this evening. Let's talk about some more things the church knows. Some things the church knows. I gave you a couple this morning. Some things that the church knows that the lost world doesn't. The church knows they are no longer bound by sin. And no longer bound by sin. Romans 6, 7 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Number two, I showed you that the church knows the purpose of the law. We know the purpose of the law. Uh, we understood from Scripture this morning that the law was not given for us to, uh, to be saved by. The law cannot save. The purpose of the law was that we might be brought to Christ. It was our schoolmaster. And the Bible says this very, very clearly in Romans 3, uh, where it says in verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And in number three, we ended with this thought this morning. The church knows its future is eternal redemption, not eternal death. The church knows because the Bible shows us and tells us. The church knows that uh, the, the world changing and breaking down and becoming more immoral and wicked, none of that has thrown God's schedule off one bit. Things are going to happen just like God said they were going to happen. He's still in control. The church knows this. Because scriptures tell us this, and we saw this in Romans chapter 8, 
And uh, we saw it also in 1 John chapter 3. Actually, I don't think we actually read 1 John 3, verse 2, but it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That may not be much comfort to you, uh, but I am pastoring imperfect people as an imperfect pastor, and I am so thankful that what we are today is not going to be our eternal state. There is coming a day when we will be like him in every respect. We won't be God, but we'll be just like him in our nature, in our character. I believe it, and I hope you do too. Let's get into the next thing, number four. The church knows that all things in this life will culminate for our good. The church knows that all things in this life will culminate for our good. Most of you in your minds already know where we're going. Find Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. This is different than the last thing I just said because there are some things that happen universally in this world. There are some things, every, it seems like every time there's a hurricane, earthquake, or, or major forest fire, uh, people lose their minds and say, oh, it's the signs of the time. Well, no, those things have been happening since the fall of man in the garden. Uh, in fact, almost all of the churches that had letters written to them in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, nearly every one of them were destroyed with, with in, in, in tragic and cataclysmic uh, disaster of earthquake or flood or fire. Uh, it's nothing new. Those things happen all the time. But we can rest assured that God is still in control. What I'm talking about now, though, is a much more personal thing. The things that we endure personally, whether it be personal attacks against us as Christians or just heartache and sorrow that we endure living in a, in a sin-cursed world, enduring a, the, the the existence in a sin-cursed body, those things should not shake us. We need to understand that all things still work together for good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. They still work together for good. That's not true for the lost world. It's not true. Because many of them will end up in, the, in a devil's hell throughout eternity. So all things in their life are not working together for their good. In fact, many people will spend their entire life chasing the next excitement, chasing the next satisfaction, only to one day find out that all of those things work together for their destruction. But for the child of God, for the church of the living God, we know, according to verse 28, that all things work together for good. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful. Because there are some things in this life that I don't understand. There are some people that have suffered, good people that have suffered, and I don't understand why God would allow that to happen. But I sure am glad I know that all things work together for good. There's some hard questions that we get asked. If God is so loving, why did this happen? If God is so gracious, why did that happen? Do you know you don't have to have, you don't have to have an answer for all of that. All you have to do is say, I don't know, but I tell you what I do know. I do know that all things work together for good. At the end of the day, when you draw your final breath, if you are a child of God, if, you, if your life on this earth ends and your eternity begins in the presence of our Savior, then you can truly say, it all worked together for good. Amen. I still believe it. In Philippians chapter 1, you go ahead and flip over there with me. Philippians chapter 1, I'd like to read verse 12. And as you're finding it, let me give you a kind of a run-up to what we're reading there in Philippians 1, verse 12. The Apostle Paul, uh, who was uh, uniquely acquainted with suffering and the Philippian church, uniquely acquainted with it because the early the, the Christians that made up the Philippian church were directly responsible for some of the suffering in Paul's life. 
Now, if you'll remember, when Paul arrived in Philippi, he began preaching the gospel, and as things uh, kind of fell apart there, he was arrested, he was beaten. The Bible says they laid many stripes to his back. He was imprisoned, and uh, the keeper of the prison was given charge of them, and the Bible says they made their feet fast in the stocks. But then about midnight, according to Acts chapter 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas began to pray and sing praises unto God. The foundations of the prison were shaken. The door sprung open. And the most amazing thing of the entire night was that not a single prisoner tried to escape. There's a couple of things that possibilities there. It might just be that Paul and Silas were such tremendous worship leaders uh, that no one wanted to, to leave. Or it might just be that God had greater things planned, and God's plan was for everybody to be right where they were. Well, at the end of the night, Paul and Silas find themselves in the jailer's home, having their stripes cleaned and medicated and preaching the gospel to the jailer's family, uh, which all got saved. And then we find later, as Paul writes a letter back to the church at Philippi, he writes verses like verse 3, talking about those memories. He says, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. Verse 4 then says, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The apostle Paul says, I'm just thankful for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day. That would have been the day that he was scourged until then. That's a pretty good thing to be thankful for. The next few verses go on. Verse 8 says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all. And it goes all, all the way down, and he gets into the middle part of, sec, uh, of chapter 1. And he begins to talk about his suffering. He begins to talk about the affliction that he's endured. And then he, he kind of sums it up with verse 12. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 says, Now, um, it's important to remember that he's talking to the Philippian church about this the whole time. Verse 12 says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. You know what he was just saying? Yes, I've endured a lot. Yes, I've suffered greatly. But at the end of the day, all of those things have added to the furtherance. It's given more occasion for the furtherance of the gospel. What he was saying is, all things work together for good. Amen. Remember Joseph? Way back there in, the, in the, the chapter 30 to 35 section of the book of Genesis, Joseph's brethren have, have mistreated him. They kidnapped him, threw him in a pit, planned to kill him. Uh, a, a band of traders going by. They pull him up, sell him to the traders who take him into Egypt, sell him as a slave. He's bought by Potiphar, a servant in Potiphar's house. And one thing leads to another. He finds himself in an Egyptian prison for something, guilty of something he never, uh, accused of something he wasn't guilty of. Finally released from prison and um, God exalts him and lifts him up throughout the chain of command in Egypt. He finds himself sitting over everything, second in command of Pharaoh himself. His brothers stand before him, not realizing who he is, but knowing that they rely on this man for food. There's a famine. They're going to die if this man doesn't help them. And then it's revealed to them that the man they're relying on is the same man they tried to kill all those years before. Joseph says, don't worry about it. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. You know what Joseph was saying? All things work together for good. Just keep going. Just keep going. These are some things the church knows. Some things the church can grasp and hold on to. And the lost world doesn't understand. God's providence, his sovereignty is not impacted or affected by tragedy and loss in our eyes. In fact, God many times is working with and through the, the most difficult situations in life. I'm glad I'm a part of the church of the living God. Amen. I know that all things work together for good. I know. I hope you know as well. Let me give you another one. Find the first John with me, if you would, please, the book of 1 John. I mentioned this morning that you may want to hold your place there because we're going to be back there. Well, we didn't make it back this morning, but we're there now, so maybe your ribbon is still there. Maybe not. 1 John, 
something else that the church knows, not something the church guesses about, wonders about, doubts about, something the church knows. The church knows its position in Christ. We know our position. It's impossible for me to know how many times that I've asked people if you were to die right now, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? Do you know for sure that God is your heavenly father and they would respond with something like, well, I hope so. Well, I, I think I would. What a tragic response to a, such a, an urgent and important question. Something with an eternal implication. And most people respond with, I hope so. The church knows our position. We know it. We know it. First John chapter 5, verse 20. First John chapter 5, verse 20 says this. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. That's our position in Christ. Even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. I know that I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm not hoping that I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm not hoping that one day I manage to find my way and accept it in the beloved and in a part of his church. I know right now where I stand. I know that I'm in Christ Jesus. I hope you know too. The book of 1 John is quite unique. It's been misunderstood and misinterpreted by many people. The book of 1 John is not a book full of things to do in order to be saved. That's how it's been taken by many people. It's not a book telling you what to do in order to be saved. It's a book that tells you what to do in order to have confidence and assurance that you're saved. There's a difference. There's only one way to be saved. That's by grace through faith. That's the only way into Christ Jesus. But many people have sat in my office and said, Preacher, I just struggle with my salvation. I struggle with assurance. I don't know why. And I begin to ask them, well, What are you doing with the Word of God? Are you obeying what God says? Uh, tell me about your life. And many times I already know. You can tell by watching people's habits around church, their faithfulness, things they're doing, things they're posting and saying. You can tell a lot about people by, by just watching people. And I can say, well, the Bible says this. How are you doing with this? Well, I could probably do better there. Are you reading your Bible every day? No, I'm not like not reading like I, like I should. How much time are you spending praying? Well, I really don't pray like I should. Well, how about this? How about that? And at the end of the day, we sit back and say, you're not doing anything that God told you to do. Why would you feel saved? Why, why would you have confidence? Let's give a few things here in the book of 1 John, some things we can do. Uh, to know that we're saved, not to be saved, but to know that we're saved. And this is just a few of them. There's, they're all the way through the book of 1 John. Let me give them to you real quick. Uh, in 1 John chapter three, or chapter 2, rather, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Well, that's a hard one. Way to go. Way to start, preacher. That just knocks me right out from, of the running from the very beginning. Well, this is what the Bible says. We know that we're in him when we keep his commandments. It doesn't say we keep his commandments so that we can be in him. It says we know, we have this confidence and assurance. It does something for us when we realize something inside of us desires to please him through obedience. It says the same thing in chapter 2, verse 5. But whoso keepeth the, his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Obedience to the scriptures, obedience to the commandments of God, they serve a purpose in our lives now that we're saved. If you aren't obeying God, then you're missing, you're missing the benefit that comes from obedience. Number two, we know we're saved by the way we love the people of God. Oh, that hurts. 
This is convicting to me. It really is. It's convicting to me for a few reasons. I was away for almost two weeks, and I missed you people. I miss you. I told my wife several times on the way home, I can't wait to get back to the church. Uh, I, I, I have to go away. I, there's things I have to do. And I, I, I love that I've had the opportunity to go. And, but man, I love the people of Faith Baptist Church. I love you. But I'm not commanded just to love you. I'm commanded to love the whole church. There's some people that are part of the family of God that I'm not too fond of. Let's look at it together. Look what it says in chapter 3. If you were waiting for me to give you the list of those people, you're going to be disappointed. Chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 14. We know, I love it, we know. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. (laughs) And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hmm. The church knows its position. And according to 1 John, you can gain assurance. You can gain confidence. you, You can have that assurance of salvation. First of all, just start obeying God. You'll be amazed at what it does for you. Number two, start loving the brethren. Just love the brethren. With their faults, love them. Stop trying to correct the brethren. Stop trying to fix the brethren. Stop trying to point out all the problems in the brethren and just love them. Just learn. Hey, the Bible says that we should receive one another as Christ received us. Ouch. He received me when I was pretty unlovable. He received me with some faults, some failures. He received me. And I'm supposed to receive you the same way. And you're supposed to receive me. Love the brethren. Look at chapter 4, verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. There's something about this. There's a connection between the way we treat the church and the confidence that we have, the the security, the assurance we have in our salvation. The book of 1 John is very consistent with John's gospel. In chapter 13 of John's gospel, verse 34 and 5, it say this, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this... Shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another? Amen. It's pretty good. The very next chapter in the Gospel of John says this. Chapter 15, verse 12, I guess it's two chapters away. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Jesus preached it and taught it out of his own mouth. And his disciple, John, says so clearly over and over and over again, in the gospel and in the epistle of 1 John. Love one another. Jesus said, they're going to know who you are by the way you love one another. Man, that's pretty convicting. The gentleman had been coming to our church for, I don't know, three or four weeks. And um, and uh, he, I, I don't even know, I don't know the man's testimony. I don't know anything about him. But a few weeks ago, uh, on, on the way out, I said, uh, we haven't scared you off yet. And he kind of laughed, and I said, we got some crazy people around here. He said, well, I told her, these are some of the happiest people I've ever seen. <laughs> One man's happy is another man's crazy, I suppose. But <laughs> he went on, we went on to talk about how, how we love one another. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesus said, hey, they're going to know you're my disciples. He told the 12, they're going to know you're my disciples by the way you love one another. If that is the only, hey, listen, if we did not have the ability, if we lived in a country where we were not allowed to publicly proclaim that we're Christians, if we could not publicly admit and confess that we are part of the body of Christ, would people know that we are Christians by the way we love one another? Jesus told his disciples, if that's all you've got, 
it ought to be enough for them to know that you're my disciple Amen. because you love one another. It's uh, easy to preach, but so hard to live sometimes. Building on that thought, back to 1 John chapter 3, we know that we're in him not just because we love the brethren, but we know that we're in him because of how we show that love for the brethren. Look what it says in chapter 3, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. There it is again. You want that assurance? Start demonstrating and exhibiting that love for one another. <laughs> we Don't raise your hands because every single person has done it this morning, more than likely. Pass somebody and say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? I had to apologize to somebody this morning because I passed by and I fully intended to stop and have a conversation. But as I began to ask them how they were doing, somebody called me from the foyer and I just, how you doing? I didn't wait for an answer. I just, I just went away. How you doing? Like, I really care. We, we all do that kind of thing. We do the same thing with love, though. Say, I love you. When's the last time you decided to love people in some other way besides just in word. When was the last time that you went out of your way to make sure somebody knew you loved them? Not by telling them, but by showing them. According to 1 John, you can assure your heart before God by putting your love into action and not loving just in word or in tongue, but in deed. This is missing from the church. There are some people, uh, I say I'm envious, and I hope you understand I mean that in a, in a good way. They just have a, they have a gift for showing their love. She's not here tonight, and so I can say this without trying to steal a blessing from her or trying to puff her up. But Miss Ellen Price has sent some of the most beautiful cards to people in this church when they were sick, they've had babies, they just missed them at church, just randomly, just wants, wants people to know that she loves them. There's other people, and I could name names, some here this evening, who they, they, it's amazing to me to watch them love people. Not listen to them tell people, but to watch them love people. That's a biblical principle. Let's love one another. Nothing wrong with telling me you love me. Nothing wrong with me telling you I love you. But when's the last time that someone knew you loved them because of the way you treated them? Because of something you did for them. Maybe because of something you didn't do for them. That's what the Bible says. You can assure your heart before God by showing your love for the brethren. I'll give you this last one. 1 John chapter 3, a little bit further in verse 24. It says, and he, that, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Chapter 4 verse 13 says something very similar. It says, hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. When all else fails, you know one of the greatest evidence is that I'm a child of God is the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God that according to Scripture has sealed me into the day of redemption. The Spirit of God that according to Scripture, uh, when I don't know what to pray for, He does. He, he knows exactly what to pray for. Uh, the Holy Spirit that according to Scripture will guide me into all truth. The Holy Spirit that according to scriptures is my comforter that Jesus promised he would leave us, that we would never be alone because of it. The Holy Spirit that convicts my heart and points out the sin in my life. The Holy Spirit that guides me. It's not some mystical hocus pocus superstitious. It is something that is as real as the air I'm breathing. The indwelling Holy Spirit. 
It's the greatest evidence of my position in Christ Jesus. But then I like the play on words, and maybe you missed it as we read that verse the first time. All of these are about how we know that we're in Christ Jesus. But the verse says it differently in verse 24 of chapter 3. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. Did you catch that? This, it's not just that I'm dwelling in Christ Jesus, that's my new position, but the Bible says he's dwelling in me. Amen. That's a comfort. That's a comfort. When you couple that with what Jesus said in John when he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, I'll never, I won't leave you comfortless, sure is a joy to know that I'm never alone. I'm never alone. These are just some things the church knows. We don't have to guess about it. We know it for sure. I got a few others here we won't get to. I'll just throw them out at you briefly. The church knows the eternal keeping power of God. Paul proclaimed this in 2 Timothy chapter 1 when he says, For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. The church knows that God's a trustworthy God. He can keep those things. I believe he's talking about the soul. Uh, number seven would be the church knows how to abound in all things. And Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And then I would just finish with this by saying the church knows the true purpose of the trials that we go through. We know it. James says in chapter 1, verse 3, knowing this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. What we go through is for a reason. Romans chapter 5 gives us that process of patience, the process of tribulation. I'm glad that God's always at work in everything that, that goes on in our lives. I, I mention it, it seems like I mention it often, but uh, Brother Whitaker sings a song many years ago. I haven't heard it in a while. Nothing can touch me that doesn't pass through his hand. And what a, what a great truth. It's right from John chapter 10 when it says that we're in Jesus' hand and he's in the Father's hand and no man can pluck us out of his hand. It's an amazing truth. Nothing can touch me that doesn't pass through his hand. It's a comfort, isn't it, church? Just a few things that the church knows. I'm glad I'm a part of the church of God. Let's stand together, please. Lord, thank you for another chance to study your word. Lord, nothing that we have seen in it today is complicated or deep. But Lord, every bit of it's precious and valuable. God, thank you for the comfort that we find in knowing these things. Father, I pray that you would take these very simple thoughts. God, would you use it to feed and to minister and strengthen your people. God, would you please fit us and equip us for the week that's just ahead. And we'll thank you for it, Lord. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you just stand quietly with your heads bowed? The piano will play something softly. The altar's open this evening. I don't know how the Lord may have spoken to your heart, maybe through the music earlier, maybe through the testimonies, maybe through the preaching. Whatever it might be, the altar is open and it might be a great night to make one more visit to the altar before we head out for another week. Some have already come. Maybe you should join them. As you're all on the altar of sacrifice laid, heart does the spirit control it's a good song I think we'll sing a verse what page is that Brother Luke page 476 in your hymn book page 476 let's sing it together on that first verse page 476 Sacrifice lay.
look this way. Thank you so much for being in church today. It sure is good to be back together again. I hope that you'll plan to be here on Wednesday as well. And uh, there's a lot of announcements. There's a whole lot going on right now uh, at the church with different uh, projects and different services coming up. So make sure you get your bulletin. Remember that the, the uh, time on the, the banner above my head is not correct. We're going to start that service a half hour earlier than that. And so on Zonka Sunday, it'll start at 1030 uh, and not 11. So other than that, everything else in your bulletin should be correct. Uh, don't forget about the seniors dinner this Thursday, Brother Whitney. There is no morning Sunday school, correct. There'll be no Sunday school on Zonka Sunday, and also the Sunday before is harvest dinner. There'll be no Sunday school hour that week either, and that service also starts at 1030, okay? And we'll have a big dinner downstairs. Anytime we have a dinner downstairs, it's very difficult to have 10 o'clock hour with the class downstairs, and, and so uh, we just, we'll just start a little bit early and, and not have that 10 o'clock hour. All right. I think that's all of the announcements. Uh, I love you, church. I hope that you have a wonderful week. And uh, let's, uh, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Brother Leonard, why don't you come over here and dismiss us in prayer. And um, Lord willing, we'll see you on Wednesday. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, we're so thankful to have our pastor back. And thank you for the safety that you gave him on the trip. Lord, we're so pleased to, uh, that we get to be a part of the, the Zonka Translation Project uh, through our church. Lord, I pray that... Uh, you would put a hedge about those that uh, uh, that you're using, Lord, to uh, to be a part of the translation process. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with us as a church, that we'd continue to uh, to support um, with those from here that are that are being a part of it. And uh, Lord, that we'll continue to support those uh, in the country. Lord, I pray now that you'd be with us as we. Uh, head to our homes and be with us throughout the week. Lord, uh, watch over us and protect us and bring us back again at the appointed time. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen.